good morning, everyone. If you could take your seats, we'd appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, God is good. Oh, come on. God is good. And all the time. You believe that? Next week, I want to bring a message entitled, How to Survive the Election. <laughs> I promise it will not be political in nature, but uh, I think it's a word we need to hear. I believe that uh, we are entering into one of the most divisive elections in anybody's lifetime. And we, how many of you know we need Jesus? Our country really does, and, and we need to get through this. And I believe God's given me a word to help us to, uh, to do that. We'll get through it intact, and the Lord is with us. We are blessed this morning to have the uh, director of Vineyard India here. Uh, the last time George and I were in India, we traveled up to way up in the north of India in a city called Dehradun. Uh, it is so far north, it's right on the border of Nepal, and you can see the Himalayan mountains. And it is, uh, it's just gorgeous, uh, gorgeous up there. And uh, God is moving in a really amazing way in India. And it's, it's interesting, it's sort of like um, the best of times and the worst of times. It, 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 is, it is incredible what God is doing all over the world, but particularly in India. And India is a strategic nation now. It is the largest nation in the world. And I believe that God is strategically placing it in such a way as to impact the, impact the world. And uh, there, is a, there is a mighty move of the Spirit of God there. The devil is not taking this lying down, and he's pushing back. And uh, so we are honored and blessed to, to have with us this, this morning um, Pastor Sonny from uh, Dehradun, India. Come, brother. Well, good morning, everyone. And what a privilege to be here. And before I say anything, I just want to say thank you to you all for investing in my country. I know the history. I know how you have been involved. And as an Indian, I just want to say, as I worship with you here, I feel I worship with my brothers and sisters. And of course, we are the same family, the Vineyard family. So it's special for me to be here this morning. And I want to say thank you from my heart. Thank you for your faithfulness. I bring greetings from Vineyard India to you, and especially from my church, Dehradun Vineyard Fellowship. Uh, my wife, Vika, and my two children, my daughter, Juvi, she's 17, and my son, Shalom, is 11. And uh, Pastor Tom was there, uh, and it was a pleasure to meet him. This is the third time meeting him. First time we met at the Global Summit in uh, Columbus, Ohio. So before I talk, would you like to hear a kingdom story from India? Yes. Okay, let's do a kingdom story first. So me and my wife, Vika, we planted the Dehradun Vineyard Fellowship. It's our 19th year now. And uh, God has been very faithful. And uh, in spite of all that the devil can throw at us, we stand on the promise of Jesus, Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church. Amen. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we have been there, and we have 11 times had to move locations because we don't have our place. This last time, this kingdom story is from the last location we were at. We were at this hotel, and we were worshiping in their restaurant on the third floor. And we were there for more than three years, and we had grown, overgrown the space. And we had too many children in our children's church that were kind of disturbing the hotel. But the, but the, the owner has been very generous, 
and very good to us. So in his very polite way, he came in, on the, in, after three years, he came to me and said, I think you should look for another place now. You know, in place of telling us, okay, you need to move. In a very polite way, he said. So, so he started to, and I would, you know, just ask for some more grace because we didn't have a place to go. But he would come again and again and say, are you looking for another place? So this Sunday, you know, we had everyone in the church show up. And we had lots of kids, lots of noise, celebration, you know. And after we finished worship, I had the phone from the manager of the hotel, from the front room, you know. And she calls me and says, you know, Pastor Son, you need to come and see me after the worship today because we need to talk something. And I thought, oh, no. This means this might be our last Sunday here, you know. So I don't want to go, you know. I'm just taking my time. She calls me two times, and she said, you need to come now. So I said, okay, I, as I go down the stairs, I see her coming up, and I thought, no, I'm going to hear a bad news. And she comes straight to me, takes hold of my hand, and pulls me in the side and said, how many people were there today, you know, up there? And I thought, oh, no, what should I say? So, <laughs> so I, I thought, okay, I'll just tell only the adult. So I said, we were around little bit more than 100 adults there. I didn't tell the teens and the children. <laughs> so that's what I say to her. She said, OK, come to my office. So I went with her to her office. And as I go there, she, she sits in her desk. And then she tells me to sit in the front. And she said, look at this. And I look on her right side, there's a big screen. And there's a circuit camera up. And she, she, she says, I've been watching you as you've been worshipping for the last three years over there. <laughs> She can watch us, but can't hear anything, you know. So she says, I see you every time, you know, with your hands up. I think you're singing. And then, you know, all the announcements, and then you talk for a long time. And then, then she says, I see all these people coming up, you know, to, and I think they come to receive prayer. So she said, I want to tell you something. Three years back, my daughter, she got married, and very soon discovered that because of something wrong with her womb, she can't conceive, you know, she can't have a baby. And in our culture, that's not very good, you know. So f for them coming from a different background, you know, it was like the mother was very concerned for her daughter, you know, because it's like a stigma, you know, like a shame. So she said it, it has been a, uh, a topic of great sorrow in our family, our daughter not being able to conceive. And she said, but around nine months back, one of the Sunday mornings when as people came for prayer, I'm watching you on the screen, I thought I'll also pray to Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, and she said, okay, Jesus, if you bless my daughter with a child, I know that you are God. You know? And she said, I have called you to tell you today that last week my daughter delivered her baby. <laughs> God is indeed moving all around the world. Amen? Yes. Amen. You know, the beautiful thing is, she said, I believe in Jesus. And she said, why I wanted to know, the, the best story, you know, why I wanted to know how many people were up there is, because I want to celebrate it with the whole church, your people, and I want to buy you breakfast next Sunday, everyone. <laughs> uh, and I was like, what? But I made a mistake, you know. <laughs> I said, actually, we were more than 150 people because they were children and youth also. She said, no problem. We'll celebrate together. I said, OK, by the way, breakfast would be hard. Is it OK if you give lunch after worship? She said, yeah, I would do anything, you know. So, so just wanted to share that story because it ties in with what I'm sharing this morning about kingdom vision. And something about kingdom vision is that God is always at work. You know, so many times we see it, but there are many times we don't see. But God 
is always at work. You know, in John chapter 3, verse 8, the first part, A part of John 3, 8, the words of Jesus, he says, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. You know, when I read this, I also see the same with the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't see, you know, from where the Holy Spirit is moving, but we do see the effects of the Holy Spirit right. afterwards. You know, like in this story, I had no clue what was going on. But God is at work. I thought that's going to be the last Sunday. But that, you know, was the greatest celebration for us, you know, that day, you know. And I, I, I'm so excited, you know, that we serve a God who is always at work, okay? So, so for us, kingdom, as we all know, kingdom of God in its simplest form is the reign of Jesus Christ as Lord and King. That's what kingdom is all about. And vision, in its simplest form, is the ability to see. So kingdom vision is the ability to see God in his glory at work, you know, reigning over our lives, our families, our cities, our nation, and nations. And in my b brief few minutes here in this church, I see that lived out in this church. I can say that, you know. It's been amazing, you know, just to sit there and I thought, do I have anything to say here? You know? <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's amazing what God is doing, you know, in people's lives and in families and in your city and in this nation and nations. And I see nations, you know, when I will think about your church, one thing I can say, the big word that comes to me is nations. So hold on to that word. That, that is very prophetic also for you. Nations, you know, so, so hold on to that word, okay? Ministry flows from kingdom perspective and focus. From there, the ministry flows. Developing a kingdom vision is about understanding the king and the vision of the king, Jesus. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, mark the words of Jesus. He's quoting, of course, from the Old Testament. But this is what he had to say. This is the mandate of the ministry of, the, of Jesus and the, min, and the mandate he laid out for his church. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, the words of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the ear of Lord's favor. Yes. You know, I know this is a challenging year for your nation as you're going to talk next Sunday, but I'm here to declare the ear of Lord's favor on yes, this nation. Yes, Amen? You know, because we serve a mighty God who is the one who raises leaders, places leaders, puts presidents, removes president. In my country, you know, governments come and change. At this time, it's a hard time for our church and the church in India, but I know the one who reigns, you know, and who rules and who is above all the governments, okay? So when we see about the kingdom, there are two words used to understand kingdom in Greek in the New Testament. The first is malkut, and the word malkut is in the sense an active rule and reign. It's not passive. The reign and the rule of Jesus is active. And the second word that we read about kingdom 
again in Greek in the New Testament, is basalia. And the word basalia is a rule and reign of a sovereign power. So Jesus was saying God's rule and reign has come to earth and it has come in me. Jesus is the one who reigns and rules and he is sovereign. Yes. No one questions him. You know, he appoints and disappoints. You know, he is the one who reigns. Okay? So that's kingdom. And vision, if we define vision, vision is a revelation. And that's what God gives his church. A revelation. Divine guidance. He guides us. Of course, through his Holy Spirit. That's one of the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, to guide us. The ability to see what God is doing. You know, God has a vision for every one of us. Every single one of us. God has a vision. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future. God has a vision for every single one of us. He has a vision for the church and what he wants to achieve. You know, it's not that he has a vision, but he has a vision of what he wants to achieve through us and as a body of Christ. Okay, so we need to be aware of this, that we need the kingdom vision, vision of the king. Okay, so that, us, that, that is what makes us go back to Jesus and his mission. If you want to have a kingdom mission, we need to come back to Jesus and to his mission. And what is the mission of Jesus? Church. Church. Jesus says, is my church. It is his church. You know, one of the things in the vineyard we always hear, God said very clearly to John Wimber, give me back my church. He is so passionate about his church. You know. And he wants his church. Matthew 16, 18, I love this verse, you know. This has been a foundation for, uh, for me and my wife. You know, Matthew 16, 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. You know the very words of Jesus. Five words. I will build my church. 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 That's us, friends. He, he is all about us. He invests in us. He's passionate about us. He loves us. And that's his mission. And we need to come back to Jesus and his mission. We love Jesus, and we love his mission, his church. And that leads us in our kingdom vision perspective is doing what the Father is doing. You know, Jesus says in his ministry, I don't do anything of my own. I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. And that is what kingdom vision is all about. It's doing what the Father is doing. And again, you know, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 and 46, 
This is what Jesus gave uh, as a parable. He said, kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in, in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on a lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. And I know Jesus spoke these words in the context of the, you know, the church for the kingdom, but I want to bring it, you know, the first part, you know. I told a story about this woman who was not seeking the kingdom, but stumbled upon the kingdom, you know. And I want to tell you my story. Would you like to know my story? Sure. You know, I grew up in a very traditional Christian nominal background. And when I was 14 one day, my mother told, I have two elder sisters, so they had gone for a youth retreat. Uh, so my mother said, it's getting late. Why don't you go and bring them home, walk with them? So I felt very responsible as 14 year old. I have to bring my sister's home. So I reached there and maybe they were, uh, they were not over and I sat right at the back where the meeting was going on and as I was standing, you know, the, the man of God, I don't even remember who he was, I was just a 14 year old kid, he was bringing in the gospel and I just came and sat there and for the next 15 years I just sat and I listened to him and I realized what Jesus has done for me. And after that, he, he asked, anyone wants to give their life to Jesus? I was the first one to run from that place and come and give my life to Jesus. You know, I was not seeking. I stumbled upon it. But God was at work. You know, God was at work. I don't know if your story, but you know, there are so many of us in this world that we don't even are pursuing God but it is God in pursuit of our lives. You know, he is always at work. He's pursuing us, you know. So I gave my life, but then I didn't know what to do, you know. I went back home. I knew I had given my life to Jesus. He's my savior. And I was just living my life. Next summer, you know, this was in October, in May, end of May, my one of my elder sisters, she was going to a youth camp. So my mom said, okay, Sonny, you carry her bags with her and go and drop her to the campsite, you know, where she's going. So I go with her to the campsite to drop her. When I arrived at the campsite, I saw there were a lot of young kids like me there. And I thought, wow, I can join this camp, you know. Why not? And then I saw, you know, my school teacher was the camp director, you know. <laughs> And he said, oh, Sonny, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I, I came to drop my sister. He said, why don't you join the camp? I said, okay, you know. So I went home, picked up a few things, came back and joined the camp. And the discipleship process began from that day, you know. And, it, and the next year, the same school teacher became my class teacher till my high school and took me on and discipled me. I was not looking for it. I stumbled into it. But God was always at work. And that went on for my life for the next five years till I was, I graduated from my, whole, uh, my school and I was in the first year of my uh, university doing a business degree. Up till then, Jesus was my savior, but he had still not become the Lord of my life. I was the Lord of my life. He was my savior. And I don't know about you, a lot of us live that way, you know, where Jesus is our savior, but he has not become the Lord of our life. So, and I was leading the youth in our church, you know, I was a youth leader. Jesus is my savior, you know, but I have all the plans, you know, I will do the business degree, I'll go in finance business like my father, and I'll make a lot of money, you know, and and I'll do all that. And then 
as I, as I was leading the young people in our church, you know, I would do the choir thing and the Bible study and everything. These two young girls from South Korea came to our church and they came to our youth and said, we want to be part of this youth uh, meeting. She said, can, uh, they said, can they join? I said, yeah, you're very welcome to join us. So from that day, every Sunday afternoon when we would have a youth meeting, they would come and sit right in the front. They would sing with us. The problem was they didn't know any English. <laughs> they didn't know any Hindi. But they knew how to smile, you know. And they sang with us. But every time as I would lead the meeting and these two sisters would sit right in front of me, I started to hear a voice in my ear that started like a whisper. Sunny, they are doing what you are supposed to do. And first, I didn't want to hear that. You know, <laughs> because I had already figured out everything, you know, what I'm going to do in my life. But then every Sunday, the whisper got louder, louder, <laughs> louder, louder, like it became a shout. I got possessed with it every time. And then what happened is I would go to the market. I'll find these two sisters. I'll go anywhere, you know, any place on the streets, on the roads, I would see them. And as I would see them, God would speak to me. And I knew what God was telling me. I knew what he was telling me. Sonny, you are supposed to do what they are doing. They came in obedience to God as missionaries to our country without even any knowledge of the language not knowing why God was taking them and calling them to India but God is always at work I am a fruit of their obedience you know what God is moving and many of you maybe you get chances to go uh, get a call to go on a mission trip or something and you think what can I bring what can God bring Amen. and that is what kingdom vision is all about yes. the reign and the rule of Jesus you know so I gave my life to Jesus and he became the Lord of my life Proverbs twenty nine eighteen. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. You know, last night I was dro driving with Pastor Tom, and he said something. He said, I'm just a preacher from Ohio, you know, and God would take me to nations. And I was sitting next to him, and I said, I'm just a small kid from nowhere in India, you know. And God promised me that he will take me to every continent as a witness to him. Amen. You know. Who am I? But God, the one we serve, is the king who reigns and rules. And we need to have vision. We need to have big vision. We need to have big vision. And for my country, you know, we are, we are just a small country of 1.4 billion people. <laughs> you know, every fifth man on this planet is an Indian. That's right. <laughs> and in this country, there are many Christians. But we don't have lovers, followers, and disciples of Jesus. I love what you just shared. That's what we need in our nation. That's what the world needs. Amen. That's the mandate of Jesus. Go and make disciples of all the nations. If you read it in the uh, complete Jewish uh, translation, it says, go and make disciples, Talmudites, of all nations, immersing them into the reality of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you see the meaning of baptism? Immersing them into the reality of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ruach Hadosh, Holy Spirit. That's what discipleship is. Teaching them to obey everything I have. 
taught you. And I am with you to the very end of this age. I think that's kingdom vision. Amen. Discipleship. We are called to make disciples. But it starts with me because only disciples make disciples. It starts with me. So that's, that's what kingdom vision is all about, you know. That's what kingdom vision is all about. Let me finish with this last part, you know. Bill Hybel says the local church is the hope of the world. Local church is the hope of the world. And I want us, you know, I want you to pray with us uh, for our nation, India. I know you're invested in India. God has given you. But one thing we need to pray for our country. We have many Christians, but we don't have lovers, followers, and disciples of Jesus. Because it, traditionally when the missions came to India, you know, they came with mandate to make Christians. But Jesus wants disciples, not Christians. We don't want religion. We want relationship with God and with one another. You know. So that's what I feel I need to share with you this morning. That's what God has laid on my heart. And I'm blessed to be here. I want to say thank you, you know. Stay here, stay, 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 stay. Would you uh, stretch out your hands towards Sunny and, and by extension, we are, we are praying for this nation, India. God, you must love Indians, you made so many of them. And Lord, we love them too. We love this nation, God. Father, I thank you for this man and for the call of God on his life. Thank you, God, that he has responded to you. Lord, I thank you for the way that you're using him, his wife, Vika. Lord, I bless them now in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you would open doors and open hearts, God, that uh, you would send them, Lord, and that they would go knowing that they're sent of Almighty God. And, uh, Lord, you open doors that no one shuts. Yes, God. And you shut doors that no one opens. Yes, Lord. God, you are the sovereign God. God, I thank you for Sonny and for his heart and for this nation of India. Lord, we bless him, we bless them, and Father, we pray that you would also give us a kingdom vision, Lord. Yes. Whatever that means for each of us, Lord God, we thank you so much. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. And Lord, I pray now for each heart gathered here today. Lord, would you challenge us, God, to make you Lord? Yes, Lord make you Lord. Follow you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, God's grace and peace be with you. May his spirit fill you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen. You are dismissed.